Welcome to episode 105 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be doing a coaching call with a teacher named Rachel and discuss how to move out of the day-by-day lesson planning trap and really think big picture. Visit truthforteachers.com to get links to recommended resources, highlights from the show, and to share your thoughts in the comments. So the episode that you're about to hear is a free coaching call that I conducted with a graduate of the 40-hour Teacher Workweek Club. Her name is Rachel, and she's beginning her sixth year in the classroom. Currently, she's teaching fifth grade. Rachel and I talked about several different issues during the course of our call, but the one that I thought would be most helpful to share here on the podcast is where we examine her lesson planning process. And that's because Rachel's dilemma mirrors that of countless teachers that I've heard from all across the country. They're spending exorbitant amounts of time doing lesson planning and still feel like they don't know what they're doing from day to day. They're caught in this trap where even though they have a curriculum map or a pacing guide, or even if they've done some collaborative planning with team members, they're still planning every night for the following day. And like Rachel, they're taking the time to document lesson plans, but still feeling like they're flying by the seat of their pants, or they're forgetting to do certain things with students, even though it's in the plan, or they're constantly running out of time before getting to finish the lesson. So what you are about to hear is a conversation between Rachel and I tackling all of these issues. Her planning process is essentially done in three steps, and you'll hear me articulate each one of those steps as we go through them, because I think it's a really good model to follow. It's certainly not the only way to plan lessons, but quite honestly, I think many teachers really have never heard another teacher explain exactly how she plans, and everyone's process is unique. So it's sort of fascinating, I think, to listen in on her process. And it sounds great in theory. And that's what sort of, I think, makes this more interesting than anything else. She's doing all the right things. So why is there a breakdown here? What's going wrong? That's what you're gonna hear us uncover together and figure out the solutions. Because it's not that Rachel is failing to plan ahead. She's not just showing up to school like, okay, well, what should we do today? She's prepping ahead of time. But somehow, it's, that's not translating to feeling prepared in the classroom. She's still having to do a lot of last-minute work, particularly with going through all the resources that she's accumulated and trying to decide which ones to use. That part gets really overwhelming for her, probably like it does for you. Sometimes she's trying to do too much or just not following through or implementing each aspect of what she planned. So let's go ahead and listen in on the call and see if this can help you identify some places where you might be making missteps in your planning process. And you can streamline a little bit like Rachel. So I want to start by having you read your initial introduction to me when I asked you what you wanted to discuss during our call, because I think everything you said is really relatable and a really common set of problems. So can you, can you share that? Sure. So I struggle with effectively planning ahead. Whenever I plan the full week ahead, I end up forgetting something or forgetting what I've planned. And so instead I end up prepping for things day by day, but that takes up my planning time. I also struggle with the overwhelm. I collect all these great ideas and then I'm just not sure how to make it all happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes total sense. So what I'm hoping to do here is do sort of a deep dive into your planning process, because you mentioned trying to plan for the full week, but it just doesn't work out and you end up planning day by day anyway, right? So I'm going to try to get into more of the planning process. And you gave me more detail um, in an email because I asked for follow up. And I have to say, I think your plan sounded really great in theory. To me, it sounds like you're taking the right approach. But you described at least part of it as being haphazard or sort of feeling haphazard. So I want to walk through each step and see if we can figure out where things are falling apart and how we can tighten it up. So you said in your email, you said that each quarter you get substitutes to do um, to cover your class so that you can do long range planning. And that's when you map out when you're going to cover the standards and the pacing guide. Um, and you discuss and plan your instructional materials and your assessments and all that sort of thing. So that's the step in your planning process where you ensure that your pacing is correct and that you're hitting all the standards, right? Yep. Okay, cool. That's excellent. I, I love that process. I highly recommend that process really for any teacher, even if you can't get sub coverage to do it 
and you have to do it after school, that is time well spent because that's what's going to keep you from feeling like you're behind or like you're not going to be able to adequately teach all the standards before the year is up. So you've got to do that big picture planning so that you're sure you're moving students toward their goals. And that has to be done in advance. It has to be done at a time that you can really concentrate. So I used to do that kind of work at home on the weekend. And again, it's just once a quarter and just spend several hours really immersing myself in the essential questions and making sure I was approaching lesson planning holistically because you know that once it comes time to do that daily planning, you're not going to have that mental bandwidth or the time to really think about big picture. So This is basically a quarterly step back, like sort of a big picture look at what you're doing with kids. And what you're doing, I think, in my opinion, is an excellent first step. So are you feeling like that part of the planning process is effective for you? Yeah, I I feel like we're using that time to do all the big picture work and map everything out so we're all on the same page. We look at where we need kids to be at the end of the school year and then work backward to figure out how we're going to assess that and plan our units together. Okay, love. Okay, great. We'll keep it just like that. Then that's great. Then the second step that you mentioned is meeting weekly with a co-teacher. So you, you said, we'll discuss what the standard meant, what activities we'll do, what assessment we'll give, and we'll also dis- discuss the structure of each class. And that also sounds good to me. That's a process that I would recommend to other teachers and also to you this coming school year, because I know you're not going to have a co-teacher. You'll be in a, in a slightly different situation. So it's some sort of weekly meeting with a grade level or a subject area team or at the very least, someone else who teaches what you do so that you can bounce the ideas off of each other. Um, But even if you end up doing it alone, I think if you're setting setting aside that time to look at the specific learning standards that you'll be addressing that week and planning the activities and assessments that go with it, that's sort of the step where you'll be able to break down what you're doing each day. So you're planning those five days in advance, that whole week. And that's really important because otherwise you're going to be stuck on this hamster wheel where you just never know what you're doing the next day in the classroom, right? You have no choice but to spend every evening planning the next day's lessons. And that's really exhausting as a teacher. And it also tends to lead to lessons that aren't necessarily cohesive. When you're planning day by day, it's a lot harder to look at the connection between the lessons and sort of keep sight of the unit as a whole. So that doesn't mean you won't adjust your lessons each day. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I think the majority of the planning work should be done before Monday morning so that you're not floundering every night trying to figure out what you're going to do with your students the next day. So you've been doing that in this form of meeting weekly with a co-teacher. How have you felt about that step in the process? So I feel like that's part part of the problem. I'm really good friends with the person I'm co-teaching with. He's actually moving to Hong Kong, so we won't be teaching together anymore. But what would happen is we'd end up talking about other things and not really being focused during the meeting. We'd get off track about things that are sort of related to the lessons, but basically I'd walk away feeling like I still had a lot of work to do to iron out the details of what I'd actually be teaching the following week. Do you think that the person you're planning with feels that way too? Yeah, I I think so. We both end up doing a lot of work after the meeting. It's great to get to talk through some of the other issues we discuss in our planning But um, we never really got around to figuring out the details of the plan. And that's that's where I think I need to do things differently to make sure that we get into more details about what exactly we're doing, who's doing what, when, so we don't have to like try to figure out day by day. It's just really hard to stay focused sometimes when co-planning. Yeah, and that that can be tricky. If you have a really, if you don't have a good rapport with the people that you're planning with, then it's really tricky to feel like you're really getting your needs met because you can't be transparent with one another. And it's sort of a stiff, uncomfortable thing. But the opposite can also be a problem because if you're too friendly, then it just becomes this thing where it's really hard to focus and work. So now that you're going to be doing this a little bit differently in the coming year, is there anything that you can think of that you would do differently? to try to structure those meetings so that they're more productive? Um, I really think that I guess, well, I guess I think that really breaking it down and the structure of what you're doing and who's taking responsibility for what and what that will actually look like and really be specific and more detailed in our planning so we don't have to go back afterward and do so much. I like that. I think that's a really important takeaway to make sure that 
you know, when you're leaving the meeting, you have the level of detail that's needed so that you're not still doing a ton of work on your own. Because I think a lot of teachers sort of struggle with that. You, you know, you end up sort of chasing rabbit holes or, you know, whatever that expression is. You're like sort of got, like going off on all these tangents and meetings and not really ever getting down to feeling like you got what you needed and then you still have a ton of work to do. So, um, yeah, asking those clarifying questions, getting down to the detail level, um, I think will be really important to help with that step. So the third step that you mentioned is after that is this is something that would take place each week after meeting with your co-teacher. And you talked about how you'll, that's when you go through the resources that are provided by the county. You look at your different teachers pay teachers per purchases or whatever digital resources you have. And basically just sort of print a whole bunch of resources that you thought you might use. And maybe that's the piece also where it sort of felt haphazard to you. Um, so I'd love to hear what part of that didn't work. Let's see if we can systematize and streamline that a little bit. I feel like there's so many things I had that I wanted to use, <clears throat> you know, that it was overwhelming. And I wasn't really thinking about which ones I was going to use. I was sort of printing them out and then deciding. And there was just too much because I, I wouldn't take the time to think about, okay, if I'm doing this one thing and it's going to take 20 minutes and then I'm going to do also have time for this other thing. So I wasn't really thinking about like what I said and the purpose and really being intentional about what I was collecting and what I was printing out and thinking about how it would fit into the lesson or the unit as a whole. So it was just like this stack of papers that maybe I would use and maybe I wouldn't. Yep. I, yeah, I think a lot of teachers can relate to that because there's so many resources out there. Um, and it's tiring. You know, it's really that, that's sometimes that's the most exhausting step of planning. I feel like when you're like, OK, I need to teach this standard on this day. Here's 30 different activities that I can pick from. Oh, well, I'll just decide that day what I'm going to do. Was it that sort of thing? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, <laughs> because it, it is. It takes a lot of mental energy to try to plan that sort of stuff in advance. Um, so I think maybe part of the piece here is just planning less. Um, you know, there's no reason to print stuff out and then decide what you're going to use. So look for those gaps in the lessons. You know, decide, okay, I need something for the kids to do here to practice, you know, this one certain skill. Which one of these resources will fill in the gap? And then print just that one thing. And I think part of the way to simplify that is to trust your gut. Go with your instinct. You know, if you look at all these different resources, there's probably one that pops out to you as being the most engaging, the most rigorous, the most meaningful. Um, trust your gut and go on that and don't worry about all the things that you're not doing because there's no way you're going to have time to do all the activities that you want to do. So um, see if you can just sort of simplify that process instead of leaving it for yourself to decide later on at the last minute what you're going to do. Just decide in that moment, I'm not going to overthink this. This resource is the best one. I've had great success with this in the past. I don't need to weigh out 500 different options here. This is fine. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, for sure. Let's just go with that. So that will keep you from getting overwhelmed and from also, I think, from sort of over planning and over scheduling yourself because um, a lot of times as you mentioned, like it's, we're just trying to cram in as many things as possible. And it takes some practice to, to really sort of shift our mindset into focusing on what is the best and highest use of class time. You know, no one has enough time to do everything they want to do. So just be really selective in what you include with your plans. Does that make sense? Yep. So what piece in there do you think would make it easier for you to not feel like you have so much work to do after those meetings? If you're getting a little bit more detailed during the meeting. I feel like maybe this is something I should think about in that weekly meeting with my co-teacher or maybe my colleagues. Think about um, what what I need the kids to be able to do and then think about what resource I have that might get them there. And really think about what I want the kids to do by the end of the day and make sure that I know that in the meeting. Because even though I know where I want them to be by the end of the week, making sure I've written down where I want them to be at the end of the day, like what we're doing specifically that day and what we're accomplishing, I'm not really writing that down in my lesson plans. I mean, it's, it's like, it's kind of there, but it's not really easy to tell. And I think I need to make it a lot clearer. Right. And I like what you said also about making sure that that information is easy to see in your lesson plans, making sure that lesson plan format does that. Because you mentioned um, that, you know, you have a plan for a week, but sometimes you end up forgetting something 
or you're forgetting what you have planned. So I think that does signal that there maybe there are some tweaks that we can make to the way that you're recording your plans. Because theoretically, what you're going to do um, is listed out. Maybe it's in bullet points so that when you're teaching, you can simply glance at your plans and see what's next. So let's see if we can figure out where things are falling apart. Are you feeling like you're not writing everything down or are you not checking your plans during your lessons? So it's kind of both. So I won't write down enough detail, but then I won't also look at the lesson plans far enough in advance for it to make help me make sure that I know what I'm doing that day. I feel like maybe if I looked at my lesson plans again a few minutes before starting a lesson, it would help me remember what I need to do. And then and then I wouldn't leave anything out. That's a really important thing that you just said, I think, about looking over your plans right before you teach it. That's great. So, you know, if you're getting ready to pick kids up from specials or lunch or something, just taking that couple minutes to look over what am I doing now for the rest of the day can can really help a lot. What are you thinking that you might want to change in this area? I think in the way that I'm recording what I'm doing, I think maybe that's the missing piece for me. Because with plan book, I, I use... um planbook.com, which I like a lot, but when I'm typing into the template in the plan book, I don't like the way it looks when there's too much information. I feel like I have to scroll to see it all, and that's a hassle. I just, you know, I don't know. I just don't like doing that, and so it's just too hard to reference, and I just don't really want to look at it And during, a le- during the lesson, you know, because it's too much to read. So if I put a lot of detail, it's too much to read through the lesson during the lesson, but if I don't put in enough detail, I'm afraid I'm going to forget what I'm supposed to be doing, and it won't be enough for me to keep on track. I feel like maybe if I put my plans on a piece of paper or something where it's easy for me to look at while I'm teaching, that might help. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different requirements for lesson plans and so many different purposes for lesson plans that sometimes it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that a lesson plan is actually supposed to guide the lesson. Like it's something that should actually be a useful tool for you and not just in thinking things out ahead of time, but it can actually be um, a reference point during the lesson. And I don't know if everyone does it like this, because honestly, this isn't something that I feel like we talk about that much as teachers. Like how much are we actually looking at our plans while we're teaching? Um, But I know that, that I always did. The way that I did my plans is I would usually have like three to seven bullet points And they would be like, you know, the anticipatory set, warm-up activity, direct instruction, guided instruction, independent practice, you know, whatever the elements were. So it's not written like a formal lesson plan, but the elements of the lesson plan are there because those are just sort of the things that generally go into lessons, right? So I would write down, you know, pose this question to kids, use this book to instruct on this skill, have them do this activity, release them to do this other activity on their own. So each element's there, but it's in this really short bullet point. Um, and I'm using a lot of the same teaching strategies over and over again. So I'm not having to spell it all out every time. Um, you know, you know, I'd have like a good, you know, 10 to 15 types of teaching strategies that were my go-to and I would use them over and over. So it didn't require a lot of writing. So I would have my planner nearby while I was teaching. And then when I finished one of those elements, I'd glance down and see what the next element was. And it probably took five seconds. And I doubt the kids even noticed because I just keep talking right through the whole thing and just keep the whole lesson moving. But glancing down, having that planner right there and glancing down was enough to help me make sure that I was still on track. So it sounds like your lessons aren't or, you know, your lesson plans may not be structured in a way that make it easy for you to check in mid lesson. Um, Is there something else that you think you could do that could be helpful? Do you like to check your lessons mid-lesson? I do. And so like I told you in the email, I'm really lucky that we don't have to turn in our lesson plan books and we aren't given a lot of structure that we have to follow. And so I feel like because no one is making me do it, I've sort of shifted away from having more complete lesson plans. And, And now that I'm not doing it anymore, I'm realizing how important it really was, obviously, to have these detailed lesson plans I can follow. So I think maybe I need to just stop telling myself that I need to have the perfect template and know I just need something I can look at that makes it easy for me to come back to it 
throughout the lesson. Yeah, I think that's a that's sort of a great guiding principle. There's something that is going to help you actually during your lesson. So you're not just, you know, planning what you're going to be doing in advance, but you can actually keep checking into it to make sure that you're on track. And that'll also make it easier for you to adjust your lessons because that's another piece that sort of, you know, becomes hard. You know, maybe we thought a practice activity would take 10 minutes and then it ends up taking 20 Um, And if you're able to just check into your lesson plans really quickly throughout that lesson, it's easy to take the time to think, okay, what am I going to cut now to accommodate that? So it allows you to keep constantly reanalyzing priorities. What's the best and highest use of class time? And that way you can let go of the activities that you know you're not going to have time for because you're looking and seeing, I've got five bullet points. I've only gotten through two. We're not going to get through the, the rest. Um, And at that point, really just move the things that are absolutely essential to the next day. So, you know, if, for example, if you don't have time to get to, you know, a test or some sort of assessment on Monday and you absolutely have to have that test grade, a quick formative assessment, you know, won't do as a replacement, then sure, add that to Tuesday's lessons. But um, try to take something else out of Tuesday's lessons to make time for it. Don't try to cram the test in on top of everything else you have planned. Um, think about, you know, what can you let go of to make time for the test? So that way you're checking into your lessons, you're reevaluating, what do we actually need to do? What have the kids already shown mastery and maybe we can skip that step or maybe something that would have been nice to do, but we don't actually have time for. Eliminate things and push just the most essential things to the next day. Yeah, because I, um, I feel like so many times things take so much longer than I planned like I'll write it down in my plans and then we'll spend 15 minutes on something and then it takes 30 minutes. And I feel like if I had things documented in my listen plans a little better, if like it was more obvious, everything I had planned and needed to do during the period, I would be a little more cognizant of maybe not letting things go on so long. Because something that's not even that, that, something that's like, taking too long it's it's that I don't even realize how long it's taking or that I shouldn't have cut it short 10 minutes ago because I'm not really thinking about what comes next I just need to be more conscious of and and like make sure I'm keeping things on track and maybe not even like ending something if the kids are really into it and just being more aware of how much time I have and what else needs to get done and where we want to be going each day Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I I like this idea also of deciding, you know, well, I'm not going to necessarily end. If something is going really well and the kids are getting a lot of value out of it, maybe I don't need to move on to the next thing. And that's okay to do too. Like you don't want to cut something short just because you wrote something else down in your lesson plans. Like if you have that kind of flexibility where you can sort of follow the kid's lead and say, actually, you know, this is taking a long time, but the kids are super engaged. They're learning a lot. I'm just going to scrap the next thing I had planned and we're going to spend more time here. I think that's fantastic. So I want to sort of wrap up by addressing what you said about uh, struggling with overwhelm in this area and like collecting so many great ideas and then not sure how to make it all happen because that's another sort of problem that I think all of us struggle with because there's so much great uh, resources out there. So um, can you tell me a little bit more about your process for collecting ideas? Um, You know, do you feel like you're constantly hunting for something new? Do you feel like you're reinventing the wheel? Um... I wouldn't necessarily say I'm reinventing the wheel, Um, but in the past, I feel like the problems is that I was buying a lot of stuff from Teachers Pay Teachers. I would just see something and feel like, that's a great activity, and then I'd buy it without actually thinking, do I actually need another resource for this particular standard? And sometimes I guess I do feel like I'm reinventing the wheel. It's like I've got all this stuff and I want to use it. But I can't use it all, and it's too much. Mm-hmm. Is there something you can think of right off the top of your head that you feel like you could do differently that would help with that? I really think it goes back to what I was saying about how I haven't really thought about how I want to use the resources. It's not that I have too much stuff, because what I have is actually pretty well organized. I have it all in this Google Drive folder and they're organized like by topic and so there's a folder for ELA, a folder for math and inside each subject area folder i have it divided into units so it's organized and easy to find once i've purchased it but the problem is that i actually don't go in there and look and say okay i don't actually need another um center resource because i already have one for this unit i just end up like buying it and downloading stuff and then when it's time to plan the unit i just have too many options 
So I know that part of the problem there really is that sometimes you just see things. And so you just get it because you don't want to forget about it. Um, I wonder if maybe keeping them on a wish list on Teachers by Teachers or organizing them on Pinterest boards or something like that would help. So, you know, maybe you have one for math, one for social studies. And if you see things that you like that you might want to try to, that you may want to buy later, put them there. And then when it's time to teach that unit, you can look through and decide at that point, okay, do I really need this? Do I already have something? And sort of make that decision there. Because I understand the need to want to keep track of it and not just let it go. But maybe the way to keep track of it is just by sort of organizing the idea someplace instead of just buying it, putting it in Google Drive, and then making a decision. Yeah, you know, I really like the Pinterest idea better than Teachers Pay Teachers wish list because sometimes I wish I could sort the wish list by subject area or something like that. There's just no way to kind of keep it organized. So I like the idea of having Pinterest boards where I can keep it organized in a way that makes sense for me. And that would make it easier for me to make decisions about which resources I've come across and that I actually want to download or buy or, or use. Yep, exactly. And then when it's time to plan, you can go through and see, okay, you know, here's here's my big plan for this unit. Here's what I'm going to be doing. Um, let me look for the gaps. I don't really have anything that's going to help kids with this. Or th the kids always struggle with this one topic. I still haven't found a great way to teach it. And then you can go to that Pinterest board and say, okay, which one of these things is going to help me meet, help kids meet that learning standard and um, sort of organize your your purchasing process that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I love that. So as we wrap up, what's the principle that we talked about today that really stood out to you the most that you want to try to take action on um, that you think is going to make the big difference? Um, I'm making sure that when I'm doing the weekly planning meeting, making sure that I leave that meeting feeling like I have detailed enough plans for the week so I don't have to go back and fill in all the gaps on my own and basically end up having to plan twice. And I think also being more intentional, thinking about what do I actually need and not just trying to do more or buy more, but really thinking about what lessons are most impactful and making time for those. And I, I think that intentionally is intentionality actually is my planning. Um, that That's my biggest takeaway for me. Mm hmm. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it's hard to remember to take time to step back and sort of think about these pieces. And I'm really glad we were able to talk through some of these things because I know once the school year starts, you are going to be so busy. It's going to be really sort of hard to think about, okay, how am I going to format my lesson plans differently? How am I going to change my, you know, my organization process, my planning process? So taking the time to think about that kind of thing up front and making a plan for yourself is going to save you so much time and energy throughout the school year. And hopefully it will also help you feel more prepared each day so that you're not planning day by day. You're not forgetting what's in your plans and you're able to sort of um, utilize all that hard work because you have done a lot of hard work and mapping things out in advance and planning your units and organizing your materials. And all of that hard work can pay off if you just make these small tweaks to your system. Um, it will really work for you. And I think it's going to take a lot of the pressure off you that comes with lesson planning. Thanks for listening in on this coaching call. I hope that this was helpful for you to hear Rachel think through her process. If you are like her and that you are spending too much time looking through resources, even if you don't buy as many things as she does, you still probably have way too many options because there are so many free resources available these days. And generally curriculum companies provide way more activities and resources and worksheets than you will ever want to use. So going through all of that can be very time consuming. I encourage you to get rid of the things that are lower quality. If you're afraid you might want to use them someday and they're digital resources, put them in a folder for that unit called not using. And then you still have them, but they're out of your way and you're not, they're not bogging you down when you're trying to do your lesson planning. Next time you plan that unit, you don't even have to look through them. And same thing with the teacher's guide for your curriculum. Get a feel for which types of resources from the publisher tend to be worthwhile for your kids and just tune out the rest of the suggestions. You don't need to read or sort through or weigh them all in your mind. If you try to explore every possible option for teaching a skill, you're never going to make a decision because the more you see, the more overwhelmed you'll become. Your takeaway truth for the week ahead is this. 
Do fewer things so you can do the things that remain even better. Make it your goal to only keep the best resources at your fingertips so that you don't have to waste time sifting through the things that aren't that great. More is not better, not when you're planning and not when you're teaching. Do fewer things so you can do the things that remain even better. Have a fantastic week. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Truth for Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's E-D-U podcastnetwork.com.